Uh, a good day to you all and uh, welcome to this exciting webinar organized by the African Tobacco Control Alliance, uh, ATCA. Today's webinar will enlighten us on the tobacco industry's uh, use of intermediaries to foster its business. Uh, we will have presentations from two international tobacco control partners, and that is a campaign uh, for tobacco free kids and the Tobacco Control Research Group of the University of Bath, uh, which is a partner in the STOP initiative. Uh, STOP is a global tobacco industry watchdog created in 2018. Uh, this webinar today will also highlight the big tobacco allies report produced in Nigeria, uh, Zambia, and Uganda after ATCA coordinated its organizational members uh, to undertake research on the tobacco industry's use of intermediaries to undermine implementation of the World Health Organization's uh, framework, control, framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Uh, today, I'm pleased to announce that we have close to 200 people uh, drawn from the Americas, uh, from Europe, uh, from Asia, and uh, Australia registered for this webinar. Um, a recording of the webinar will be sent to everyone who has registered whether they are pa participating with us here today or not. Uh, the webinar is also being relayed on ATCA's Facebook page, uh, live, uh, a page with more than 75,000 followers. Also, I want to also welcome you to ask questions anytime in the course of this webinar uh, using the question and answer option on the platform, on the right-hand uh, side of, uh, of the platform. Uh, your questions will either be answered in writing on the platform or I will call the resource person concerned to answer them orally at the end of the presentations. And uh, because we have one hour and 30 minutes, I will ask our presenters to please limit presentations to 15 minutes each. Uh, my name is John Muchangi. I work as the science editor for Star Newspaper in Nairobi in Kenya. Uh, I am also a member of ATCA's network of tobacco control media professionals and a member of the tobacco, Kenya tobacco, control, tobacco industry monitoring team. I'm honored honor to be your host today. And uh, without further ado, I have the pleasure to introduce our first presenter. Uh, Claudio Tanka is an associate director of international communications at CTFK. He has more than 17 years of experience developing and implementing uh, successful communications, uh, media relations, and stakeholder engagement campaigns. Welcome, Claudio. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I am looking forward to uh, present on this uh, topic of tobacco industry intermedi intermediaries. Uh, please let me share my screen. Uh, can you can you see my screen, uh, John? Can you show me uh, if you're seeing my screen? Can you tell me? Yes, I, we can see your screen, uh, Claudio. That's great. Thank you. Uh, et seulement uh, 10 secondes pour saluer tous les uh, le gens, mes collègues de l'Afrique francophone. Uh, malheureusement, cette présentation sera en anglais, mais j'espère un jour pouvoir présenter aussi en français, peut-être en Afrique. Uh, so, uh, back to English, uh, this presentation will be uh, in English and uh, I hope to show you uh, something that uh, it's new and will get your, your attention. Uh, so again, I am Claudio Tanka uh, from the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. I don't want to spend too much time on the campaign, it's just uh, uh, the fact that it is uh, um, an initiative of former Mayor Bloomberg, and the aim of the organization is to combat uh, tobacco as the number one killer, and you will see that tobacco is, uh, means tobacco companies. Uh, these are some of the partners of the Bloomberg uh, Foundation, and uh, let me start uh, by uh, you know, talking a little bit about tobacco industry intermediaries. Uh, and by this, I mean from groups and allies of the tobacco industry. So I would like to remind you that the tobacco epidemic is a man-made epidemic. 
uh, made by multinational tobacco companies. And they, among the different tactics, they use front groups to spread this deadly epidemic all over the world, unfortunately, including Africa. Uh, intermediaries are one of the type of the uh, tobacco industry interference. There are many, as you can see here, but today we are going to focus on intermediaries. Uh, with this slide, I would like to remind you that uh, tobacco companies in the last 50 and more years, they have constantly used uh, intermediaries. Um, and uh, as a US federal court found, uh, that was in uh, 2006, uh, in a case, United States, the federal government versus multinational tobacco companies. So a U.S. federal court found that several tobacco companies, including Philip Morris International, then parent company Altria, coordinated effort in a scheme to defraud consumers and the public about the health harms of their products. The court found that for decades, Philip Morris and other tobacco-related entities sought to establish industry-favorable research by, via the creation and funding of alleged independent research organization, such as the Council for Tobacco Research and the Center for Indoor Air Research. And they used those entities to protect itself against litigation threats and government's regulation. So there are several decades of history where tobacco companies use leveraged front groups to spread the tobacco epidemic and to do many other things, including to protect them themselves against litigation. Uh, here, there is a quote from the WHO report you can uh, find online, the industry has a long history of using seemingly independent front groups to advance its case. Smoker Rights Association, frequently supported by the tobacco industry, have served as front group in opposition to indoor smoking ban. That's another way uh, tobacco, uh, multinational tobacco companies use front groups intermediaries. Uh, here, I would like to show you some of the characteristics of intermediaries. Uh, these are the results of um, several workshops that CTFK conducted in different regions of the world between 2018 and 2019. So just uh, some of the characteristics so that Eventually, in your work, if you find a front group that has this type of, of characteristics, you, uh, you know, will recognize it as a front group. So they appear, disappear, they behave like NGOs, uh, they advocate for citizen empowerment, uh, hidden financing, they question science, claim independence, participate to CSR activity, um, and then support aligned to tobacco industry messages or policies, and, and so on. Just this as a flag uh, for you when you encounter these type of groups. Uh, some of the common characteristics of these, these front groups are they tend to be covertly founded by the tobacco industry. They claim to be independent. They play a role in larger tobacco industry lobbying and public relations. They actively promote industry-funded research. I am sure you are uh, familiar with the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. And they often recommend reduced arms solutions uh, instead of other proven measures of the Freeman Convention on Tobacco Control. Uh, and again, uh, I hope you think here at the Foundation for Smoke-Free World. Uh, some definition. Let me tell you that there is like... Um, common and agreed definition uh, within the tobacco, the global tobacco control community. However, these are, are good uh, definition by our colleague of the Exposed Tobacco uh, Stop Partnership. So third party allies 
Uh, they undertake lobbying or spokesperson role on the behalf of a tobacco company. They appear to be independent and they are not. And for uh, many of these, the, those, these organizations, there is a clear evidence that there is tobacco funded. Um, then there are front groups, um, which are um, you know, more independent from tobacco companies and the tobacco industry plays a key role in the establishment funding and or membership of the organization and the group claims to act independently uh, where they are typically, typically opaque regarding their uh, financial links and then finally these astroturf groups um, here you can read the definition but I would like you to think at all these vaping groups that are bombarding on social media uh, advocates and, as you will see later, Bloomberg philanthropies for its work uh, in tobacco control. Uh, there is a variety of intermediaries. I would like you to remember that there is a variety, so please uh, pay attention uh, to uh, the different groups you may encounter. There are smoker rights association, tobacco growers, uh, uh, workers, labor unions, even uh, at the bottom of this list, NGOs like phony, fake NGOs that are advocating for tobacco control measures, whereas instead they are advocating for those measures promoted uh, by the tobacco industry, like for example, cessation. How tobacco industries use intermediaries? Um, well, they oppose, they use intermediaries to oppose uh, tobacco control laws. Probably that's uh, in the, the pr principal way, the most important way they use uh, intermediaries. Uh, they also use intermediaries uh, for tax increases uh, or for the implementation or enforcement of existing laws. Think about, for example, retailer association and plain packaging or um, labeling on uh, tobacco products. Then they use this group to gain support of decision makers, influencer, and the general public. Again, think about uh, CSR. Uh, and uh, the third one, they question through this group independent scientific research. Uh, again, I, I mentioned a couple of front groups uh, in my initial slides of the presentation, uh, and maybe you want to think at the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World here, and then they want to protect themselves uh, against litigation by saying, no, this is not a tobacco industry that say uh, a certain, made a certain statement, this is this particular organization. Um, I would like here to propose two case studies. Uh, one is uh, the International Tax and uh, Investment uh, Center, and this is something that will show you how to counter uh, front groups and the amount of efforts it takes to counter front groups. So what is the IT? Let's get back uh, to 2015 just to uh, understand. Uh, so ITIC is a Washington uh, DC based organization and they claim to be again independent uh, think tank clearing house for best practice in tax policy. Now when you see, when you check this best practice, they are very close or they mirror what the industry says when it comes to uh, tobacco taxes. So we don't want to increase tobacco taxes. They create, um, uh, they create um, uh, then smuggling, they promote smuggling, they're not effective. Uh, so that's the, their kind of uh, policies that they promote. Um, and then what they do is they help stakeholders, I mean their member to their sponsor to get a seat at the policy making table. Uh, and they operate all over the world, really everywhere. Uh, so uh, some of their main sponsors, uh, people actually sitting in the board of director included representative from major, all the major multinational tobacco companies. Um, and what I think uh, did was they host policy events, 
uh, in fancy resort, beautiful hotels where people want to go, then they prov provide technical assistance to government, conduct independent research, particularly on illicit trade. Uh, and then they're very good when it comes to media outreach. So how uh, tobacco control advocates countered isolated IT uh, and they pushed to give up any connection, any link with uh, multinational tobacco companies. Uh, here are our three key events. One is uh, COP, the Conference of Parties uh, in, uh, in 2014. Uh, and uh, ITIC was present and they were hosting a brief for uh, ministries of representative of the Ministry of Finances and tax uh, delegates uh, the day before the COP, which usually starts on Monday, and then they were doing this on Sunday before. Uh, so what did the tobacco control community to counter this, this type of interference? Uh, well, uh, the FCC secretariat uh, sent a notice to all parties saying that ITIC was a front group for the tobacco industry. The Framework Convention Alliance um, uh, communicated with the secretariats to alert all the parties uh, at the conference. CTFK, we provide some uh, uh, technical support, research, background material, and the Corporate Accountability International, they focus on uh, media to um, alert people about ITIC. And uh, it, it worked uh, because they, they were able to isolate ITIC. Then the Asia Pacific Forum in 2015, again, conference of uh, tax representative ministries and uh, organized by ITIC. And then the conference had the World Bank as a technical partner. So again, tobacco control community activated and to isolate ITIC denounced um, ITIC role. And then uh, there were some action by advocates on the ground in India and the outcomes. World Bank withdrew its support and there was many government officials uh, of several countries in South Asia say that they would not attend or send delegates to the event. And finally, the last action in 2016, public pressure. Uh, there was a coordinated effort, global effort by different partners, British Art Foundation, Cancer Research, Christian Aid, Save the Children, Tax Justice Network, uh, ASH, uh, and then uh, SIATCA and uh, CDFK. Objective was to expose links between IT and uh, Big Tobacco. Uh, there was a letter, a global letter uh, signed by many organizations, an online media campaign. And what happened is the major um, sponsors of ITIC, and that includes, for example, uh, the IMF, World Bank, and companies like Nestle, we drew uh, their support. So that was uh, the final push that made ITIC to give up uh, and, and cut all the links with uh, Big Tobacco and no more uh, representative of tobacco companies are sitting on the board. Uh, they are no longer accepting donations and sponsorship from the tobacco industry. Here, I want to show you that it takes a lot of effort to run a campaign against these um, uh, front groups. Uh, one uh, last case studies here, I would like to show you something that is fairly recent. Uh, Bloomberg philanthropies are um, under fire in different countries around the world. Uh, so from India to the Philippines, to South Africa, uh, to Indonesia, to Mexico uh, and Vietnam. Uh, and um, here, what, what I would like to, um, to point out to you that we believe from monitoring uh, the media coverage, the article, that there's some sort of coordinated effort. This is not happening by chance. Uh, uh, for example, uh, the, the narrative, uh, what we have noticed in, in these articles is that there are similar um, ideas, concepts to attack uh, Bloomberg philanthropies. Um, and uh, and uh, there are um, all related or somewhat related to arm reduction, 
um, the fact that the, they are promoting, uh, I mean, Bloomberg has a critical position when it comes to e cigarettes and to eat a tobacco product. So we believe there are good reason to believe that there is a coordinated effort at a global scale, uh, possibly coordinated by the tobacco industry. Again, let me, let me show you some similarities. Uh, the majority of articles feature experts and uh, they belong to the, these four categories and they have connection to front groups or to, um, to the tobacco industry. All these organizations are based in the US, UK or Switzerland uh, and some of them are uh, associated with International Network of Nicotine Consumers Organization, INCO, which is financed by the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World, except for R Street, another US from group lobbying-based organization or think tank. All these organizations are secretive about their funding and sources and expenditure, but the co tobacco company funded relationship have been confirmed uh, with um, you know, other ways by, by doing some research. And then a substantial number of articles do not have uh, an individual author. Uh, and this is most relevant for the Philippines that they're not really signed. Um, Finally, here, that's interesting. So by analyzing all these articles, we were able a little bit to um, reconstruct the relationship between all these front groups, intermediaries, think tank allies, and uh, uh, multinational tobacco companies. So who is paying, who is financing, supporting all these uh, front groups. As you can see, uh, multinational tobacco companies are, are somewhat supporting uh, in a different ways all these um, tobacco related front groups. Uh, and the, they are all part of these recent coordinated efforts to attack, to put under fire Bloomberg uh, philanthropies. Uh, I will stop here my presentation. I hope uh, it was interesting and it gave you some ideas uh, for the future on how to recognize, eventually counter, uh, from groups uh, and tobacco industry allies. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Claudio. Um, please note you, you can ask questions anytime in the course of the webinar using the question and answer option on the platform. And then your question will either be answered in writing on the platform or I will call the resource person concerned to answer them orally. Uh, our next presenter uh, should be Akin Bode Oluwafemi, uh, but uh, he's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I understand he's going to be represented uh, by Philip Jackpore. Uh, so I want to welcome uh, Mr. Philip Jackpore. Philip is a director of programs at Corporate Accountability and Public Participation for Africa, uh, that is Kappa. Welcome, Philip. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, but they were supposed to catch a flight and we've had some troubles uh, in Port Harcourt where he's, uh, he's at in Nigeria here. So I, I will do this presentation for him. And uh, the good thing is, uh, the report you see on the screen, Big Tobacco Allies, how tobacco companies use uh, intermediaries to foster their corporate social responsibility initiatives and promote their image in Nigeria, is one we just launched on January 29th. Uh, we did some work from January last year through to uh, January this year before the report itself was, uh, was uh, publicly unveiled. And to a large extent, um, most of the things that Claudio um, mentioned in his presentation are some of the things we, we observed and documented in our uh, country uh, investigation and reports. Now, I think the starting point is to look at Nigeria as a class. Uh, this will give us a, a snippet into um, the country. First things first, it's... Uh, the country with the largest black population on earth. You have about 200 million people. Uh, Nigeria is also Africa's largest economy as of this moment. Uh, GDP is at uh, 
2019 was estimated at 440 billion US dollars. So that, of course, is huge. Um, Nigeria signed and ratified the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco Control in 2004 and 2005, respectively. And its domestication was done via the National Tobacco Control Act in 2015. Now, you can see from 2004, 5 to 2015 is uh, basically 10 years. And the processes of getting a law enacted was one that involved a lot of back and forth because the industry was very, very much alive. And some of the things that Claudio mentioned were also observed in the process. Um, our National Tobacco Control Act in itself was defective because uh, there, there is a provision that you also have to put in place regulations for the uh, enforcement of some of its provisions. And that did not happen until 2019. So who are the major, which companies are the major players in Nigeria? You have British America Tobacco, you have Philip Morris, you have International Tobacco Company, Leaf Tobacco and uh, of, uh, commodities Nigeria, Imperial Tobacco. But of these, the major player here and controller of the about 85% of the Nigerian market, if not 90, British America Tobacco. Uh, Philip Morris uh, is a late entrant, but it's also uh, one company that has been very, very active within this at uh, the short period it has operated in Nigeria from 2015 to 8. So the Take Apart Nigeria campaign. Uh, was supposed to commence in January, of course, last year, but because of the COVID and the restrictions, uh, work actually started in March 2020 through to January 2021. Like I mentioned, the report itself was launched on uh, January 29th this year. So what did, the, did we aim to, to do? We aim to monitor discredit and isolate the tobacco industry. And what we to do this, we collected data on tobacco industry tactics to undermine implementation of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Uh, we were involved in conducting communication activities to inform and sensitize authorities and public on tobacco control, tobacco industry entities. And then, of course, most importantly, after putting all these uh, things together, organizing advocacy activities to engage stakeholders and take action was isolated tobacco companies and their allies whom we were able to dig out. So what did we monitor? Primarily, we monitored VAT's unnecessary interactions with public officials through their corporate social responsibility project, which is the British America Tobacco Nigeria Foundation, which was set up in 2002. And then we also looked at uh, Philip Morris International Funded Smoke Foundation for Smoke Free World, the unnecessary interactions also, and the agencies of government they work with. Like I mentioned, um, the Nigeria's population, which is 200 million, made up of mostly youths, is of course a, a major target for the tobacco industry. And uh, though we have laws in place, uh, the industry has, you know, their uh, intermediaries everywhere engaged in different sectors. So we monitor the agricultural sector, we monitor the education, the environment sector, philanthropy, and the research. And we found out that the industry was very, very active in this space. So some of the identified proxies of uh, interference, just like some of the things that Claude mentioned, the civil society groups, uh, media groups, research and academics, unions, chambers, groups. These are the are proxies that the industry uh, used in the investigation we were able to dig out. And so what were the evidences we sought to justify our, our position? We sought pictures, we sought audiovisual materials, we looked at annual reports, we looked at information on websites of the uh, tobacco industry, and of course their, their allies and their intermediaries. We looked at blogs, and of course, formal and informal meetings. So what did we find? Um, good, this presentation has some pictures up front, but it's good to mention some of the things we discovered. We discovered that the tobacco multinationals actually undertake partnerships with government, the Nigerian government. 
and with state government. So federal, we have the federal, state, and local government. So they're active within these three space. Um, we also found out that several entities um, organize events and implement programs that promote tobacco industry initiatives. We discovered that those, uh, some of those entities also provide technical or intellectual support to the tobacco industry. So it's a symbiotic uh, relationship. We have front groups that launder the uh, image of the tobacco industry through social development engagements. We have tobacco companies that hide behind front groups to promote educational initiatives. We have front groups that whitewash the tobacco industry image through environment projects. I listed earlier on that they were involved in uh, philanthropy, they were in the environment, agricultural, education sector. So these are some of the things we found out. And that tobacco companies use these front groups to even organize seminars and uh, trainings. And that they use these front groups to also undertake, and that is primary, unnecessary interactions with, uh, with uh, uh, public officials. We can share some of the images from our investigation here. Now you can see these images before us. Uh, the image where you have the four good looking people. These are actually youths that the uh, British America Tobacco Foundation uh, involved in so-called entrepreneurial um, uh, trainings in the Greek sector. And this was done in concert with uh, the Pan-African University in Nigeria, which is, of course, an educational institution. Uh, there's a center in that same uh, university, uh, Enterprise Development Foundation uh, Center, where British America Tobacco Foundation has been uh, working with them. And through these uh, trainings, entrepreneurial trainings, they have been laundering their image. Uh, the picture, the first picture is with the youth, of course, and then you have another picture up there where you have the man putting on the, uh, the red cap. That person is actually a public official who was invited to uh, uh, the second edition of the entrepreneurial uh, uh, trainings. But this time around, it was uh, an uh, agribusiness uh, uh, dialogue session. And of course, in the course of that event, he spoke very favorably about uh, British America tobacco and the, the initiatives in the agri sector. Uh, this is also an image from the BAT Foundation funded farm settlement project. Like, we, like I mentioned earlier, they are very, very active in the agricultural space because the Nigeria government has an initiative of wooing the youths who pursue white collar jobs back to the farms. So British American Tobacco Foundation, which is a CSR project of uh, BUT, has jumped into this space and is claiming to be a stakeholder interested in getting the youths and, uh, involved in this initiative. So this is one of the... Uh, um, Philip Morris in Nigeria is uh, doing a lot in the education sphere. Um, there's what we call the Conrad Foundation, which is funded by the Foundation for Smoke Free World. Since 2019, it has been organizing what they call the Conrad Foundation Awards. And uh, it targets uh, kids uh, in you know, schools in Ibro areas. And what you have here is a newspaper report of one of those uh, engagements where kids uh, told to develop some initiatives, it could be uh, smoke-free uh, smoke initiatives, it could be initiatives that are targeted at self-censorship. And then you have these kids who get these monies, some of them sometimes are taken abroad, uh, and you know, $60,000 is no, no main funds. And this has been happening, like I said, since 2019. You have two schools here, uh, these are prestigious schools, like I mentioned. One of these schools is Queen's College in uh, Lagos, Nigeria, which is very, very uh, popular. Um, so, Conrad Foundation is behind this initiative. And as we know, Conrad Foundation is funded by the Foundation, uh, uh, the Conrad Challenge is funded by the Foundation for Smoke Free World, which is solely funded by Philip Morris International. So, you can see the link. You know, you have the 
the schools, we have the Conrad Challenge, which is funded by the Foundation for Smooth Free World, which is itself uh, solely funded by Philip Morris International. So that's uh, in the education sphere. And our investigation was not restricted only to just uh, groups that, um, that you can uh, read about and, uh, you know, they, they, they also involve banks. They also involve other institutions that um, you could not easily get information from except you dig in, into their books. So uh, this bank, GT Bank, Guarantee Trust Bank, is one of the banks that has been uh, partnering with uh, the industry. And then um, we were able to dig into the annual report and found out some of the uh, sponsorships they've done, things they've done to support the industry. Uh, and if you can see, we, uh, in, you, you have something on the current challenge. Say students of White, White Sands schools were sponsored to represent Africa, the Global Innovation Challenge in the United States of America as Team Neon. They, completed in, they competed in the smoke-free world category and won. This bank actually sponsored four students and one teacher to the United States for this in partnership with the Conrad Foundation. And um, the information was not in the public domain. So what do we do? We dug into their books and or their, their annual report for 2018 were able to get this information. This is also another initiative in the agri sector, uh, the World Food Day, which is commemorated uh, yearly. We, Lagos State, uh, which is the, the commercial uh, heartbeat of Nigeria, which is also the most popular state in Nigeria, organizes this annual event at the farm fair. And currently, um, the, this is done in partnership with the British America Tobacco um, Foundation. So the image you see there, you can see uh, officials of the uh, tobacco industry and government officials. Um, in this picture, of course, you can see uh, these are officials of uh, BUT. This person here is the Commissioner for Agriculture in Lagos State in a handshake with uh, BUT executive. And um, these pictures were shared widely uh, by BUT on their, on their Facebook, on their Twitter, and uh, of course, they are painting themselves as socially responsible and very, very concerned about what happens in the agri sector. So these pictures were in the papers, they were everywhere. Uh, you have a YouTube uh, page on the same subject matter, and that was where we were able to dig out our information. Then, of course, you also have BAT Foundation also uh, involved in some philanthropy engagement. I think this picture is one of the states in Nigeria where you had um, uh, some youths repatriated from uh, Libya. Uh, and then uh, the state government decided to do something about uh, uh, reintegrating them into society. And behold, uh, the tobacco industry was on hand to, to play a role and do that for feasibility sake. So after all these things that we documented, uh, what were some of our recommendations? Our recommendations to the Nigerian government was primarily that it fully implements the National Tobacco Control Act and the, to the, uh, the regulations. Um, and these regulations and the act itself has um, clear provisions on the interactions between um, the tobacco industry and public officials. And um, we also recommended that all economic incentives and benefits to the tobacco industry should be stopped, that the Nigerian government prohibit all dealings, interactions uh, with industry, uh, except for the purpose of policy implementation and in which a civil society must be present as recommended in uh, Article 5.3 of the WGF CTC. We recommended that the Nigerian government establish a policy and process for its agencies to fully di disclose minutes and proceedings and interactions with the tobacco industry, and that stakeholders should regularly update information website to ensure easy information dissemination that will in turn guarantee transparency 
of their dealings with the industry, and that public officials should be educated because that was one of the challenges we found. Some public officials are not really that educated on the issues, and that they should be educated on public health implications of interactions with the industry. And we also uh, recommended that public officials interacting with the industry feel um, a conflict of interest uh, uh, form periodically, very, very important. So beyond the, that, uh, the image you have here is the public or media presentation of the Take Apart Nigeria report, which happened on January 29th, uh, with the media uh, um, in present. And this uh, document uh, received wide media reports. Some of the reports are what you see here. Uh, you have the Sun, which is a um, very popular medium in Nigeria. You have the Tribune, you have Vanguard. These are very, very popular mediums where we ensure that the uh, reports are widely submitted. I, I always do this in any uh, presentation I do. The next thing I'm going to talk about, I think, is uh, is one of the most important uh, parts of this presentation. It's the part where I get to say thank you. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. And uh, I see uh, some of our participants are, have problem with accessing the translation. Uh, if you have problem accessing the translation, you can please refresh and then you sign in again. Then you should be able to get the translation. Our next presenter is Richard Baguma. Yeah, Richard is the coordinator of the Uganda Health Communication Alliance. Yeah, Richard, welcome. Uh, Richard, are you there? Are you having a problem hearing me? Hello? We can hear you now. Oh, you can hear me now. Excellent. Uh, John, you can, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, I yeah, can hear yeah. <laughs> Richard. Yes, you can, you can smile. You know we are online. You don't need a mask. So I was saying a briefing is from Uganda. It's a good evening from here. Uh, and it's nice to be part of this group. Part of the um, team uh, that is trying to hopefully help our continent uh, fight off this uh, tobacco scourge that is afflicting us. Um, I would like to express our gratitude to our partners, ATCA, to the CTFK, to all of you who have been part of this process of exposing um, the, the, the social, uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives and the image laundering that the, the tobacco industry does here and elsewhere. I will try to keep my presentation short. A lot of the issues are like uh, what my colleague um, has just presented. Uh, so we will share what we got from Uganda. Now, the Ugandan process um, targeted uh, about 200 plus respondents. We had, uh, we had an 81% response rate. It was a process that was uh, where we did random sampling, but we deliberately chose the organization, the institutions um, that will be represented uh, in the survey. So we had CSOs, uh, we had government institutions, we had the private sector, and, and, and those that could be um, involved, especially in, in work that works with, with youth, because the tobacco industry here is targeting a lot of young people. The ones which work with uh, females, they are targeting females also a lot. So it was important um, that we go to these organizations and find out where the tobacco industry is using smoke screens um, and, and the very known tactics that they use to launder their image and promote their poison. Among our findings is that um, legislators were collaborating with the tobacco industry to undermine uh, uh, tobacco control legislation. And we had an example where a, a, a state minister for trade 
Um, we're saying, you know, tobacco is a person of choice. It can't be stopped by laws. Uh, when we were trying to, to work on this law, and even more recently, after the law had passed, has passed and it has been here for years, we have had attempts to introduce amendments to the law that will weaken the law as soon as um, the year has, has just passed. So the, the, the ongoing attempt by the tobacco industry to go through legislators to weaken or water down the law has been one, or we found was one of the things that was happening here. Uh, uh, and so going through legislators, you can imagine how that brings a face of legitimacy to the tobacco industry. Because these are elected people, these are people in positions uh, like of cabinet. And so this is um, one of the ways that we found this one was being done. Um, we can go to my next slide. Yes, the other, the other very common approach by the tobacco industry in Uganda to do its corporate social responsibility, improve its image and look like a very responsible citizen is by using environmental conservation projects. Perhaps this was the commonest that we came across in this, um, in this survey that we did. And we just chose um, a few to illustrate this, but there were many. There were a couple of them which they were using. They were going through uh, preservation of, of swamps, uh, promotion of tree planting, preservation of existing forests, preservation and conservation of um, wildlife sanctuaries. So there were all these uh, projects that they were supporting uh, and, 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 um, and freshwater ecosystems, you know, in order to, to improve and um, keep their image looking good. One of them is the Biodiversity Association uh, and the Earthwatch Institute, they are in forest management. They got funding from the tobacco industry. The other one is the Straight Talk Foundation. Now, Straight Talk Foundation is quite a well-known foundation here. It works with young people. It, it, it does quite uh, good work and with a good image uh, with young people. Now, the industry came uh, and, and went through one of their conservation projects. It's called Pre Talk and provided support and sponsorship. It was a very creative way of reaching out to young people and circumventing the legal provisions which stop them from dealing with young people and, and going through seemingly reputable organizations like The other one was called um, uh, Nature Harness Initiatives. Nature Harness Initiatives is also into tree planting. It is also conservation of forests, especially already existing uh, forests, the natural ones, but also in, in in, um, in clearing uh, rivers of plastic and other things, and also preservation and restoration of swamps. So in the, in the freshwater ecosystems. Now, this again is a very noble uh, initiative on the face of it. So you can see they were very, very clever in taking this um, uh, conservation uh, front that looks very attractive, very good, very noble in order to hide uh, behind and put their corporate social responsibility. The other thing is the marketing through influencers, especially musicians. There was um, a very clever and creative approach of using musicians and film stars, but even, even um, billboards. The, the, there was one, uh, there is a, um, an annual youth festival, big, uh, supported by Coca-Cola, big corporate uh, companies. Now, the, the British American Tobacco Uganda also put its money. And by the way, because they have to circumvent the ban on their advertising, what they do, they get these very popular um, uh, musicians and, and film people and, and comedians, and they take shots of themselves smoking or using other tobacco products. And these are the ones they use on billboards which promote these very popular events. Or when they promote their videos or when they promote their Martin music. So they got very popular musicians, young, upcoming, talented, uh, played a lot on TV and on radio, and they were using them. But what they do is to get them with scenes using their products. 
This was another way we found that they were indirectly advertising their products and especially reaching the young people. We go to the next slide. The, 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 the other way is um, that we found that uh, 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 was partnerships with uh, non-government organizations. There were non-government organizations that are supporting tobacco farmers, but also other farmers. Because in, in many of the tobacco growing areas, like some of you may know, there are also other crops that are being done. So one of them was um, going through a, a, a group, uh, the Tomosi Foundation. The Tomosi Foundation is a bit interesting because it's um, led by the first son-in-law or the son-in-law of our president. So it's a high profile, um, high image, you know, foundation that is into philanthropy. One of the things is to promote uh, cash crop growing and one of the crops that they went to uh, because the um, because their public relations the, the public relations company of BAT of the tobacco industry is also owned by the same group of people so it, it's really like uh, using uh, a humanitarian organization to do work of the public relations uh, company, which is a public relations company for the tobacco industry. So, so, and they were using things like appreciation events. They were using things like, um, they are giving tools uh, and fertilizers to, to the farmers and to support tobacco growing and all the other crops. In fact, in one of the events, they were saying they are promoting food security. So it's, it's very creative way of working with NGOs not just in uh, tobacco, but all the other livelihood uh, areas in order to, and, and, and align with very well connected um, humanitarian organizations to do, you know, uh, this work. Let's go to the next slide. So these, 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 these were, these, these, you know, you could find a lot of these uh, approaches in the different ways, like, like you know, really how, how, what happens in many of the other of the other countries one of the things that was surprising for us was that especially a lot of the youth um, oriented organizations did not realize when when you know we approached them uh, our, our our people went and approached them they didn't even realize that they were cleaning the image of the tobacco industry so one of the things that we thought was important was that the Tobacco Control Act that we have and the tobacco control regulations that have been um, passed uh, and assented to and they are in effect in Uganda should be pushed for full implementation because then we would insulate our um, leaders uh, from, from this manipulation by the tobacco industry but they would also be careful not to promote the industry because the sanctions in there are really tough and biting. The thing was that these front groups, I, I mean, we should have efforts, we should come together to have them prostituted. I think this one will be a useful deterrent, but we also wake them up that there are consequences. We also thought that because these organizations, some of them really didn't have even this information, we need to do more to raise awareness, but also to name and share uh, the activities of these front groups. We think we have been soft. Uh, we haven't really been hard on them, but we, have also, we also haven't been as much out as we, we have done work, but we need to go more. And, and this also goes with the exposure, to expose this uh, and counter them, and show that they are evil, they are illegal, they are immoral, but also we should counter them and counter the publicity that is generated. Uh, and also mass education, particularly of the youth, on the dangers that tobacco uh, poses to their lives, to their health, uh, and, and on their livelihoods. This has been done to an extent, if you now look at the findings of the Global Youth Tobacco Survey, you will notice that there have been achievements captured in there in the between the, the years uh, these two surveys have been done the latest 
and the last one. Very great strides have been done, but we also think that we need to keep these investments going. We need to keep this momentum going. The momentum we generated with, for example, CTFK uh, has been extremely useful uh, to get these results, but we need these efforts to continue. And we need to sell and market more the benefits of tobacco control. I think one of the things we do is as much as possible, talk about the dangers of tobacco use. I'm not sure that we are with the same energy, the same uh, input, uh, putting ahead the benefits of tobacco control. I think, Mr. Chairman, this is also critical that we do so that uh, we can balance uh, the bad, but also show the good and beneficial that people get. Uh, as had been recommended, I try to keep this short. The, the report um, from Uganda is online, is available. Uh, Atka has it uh, on its website. We have it on our website. So you can go in there and get more of the details. But I thought these were some of the important uh, findings and recommendations that we found that we should share in this seminar. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and colleagues. Thank you so much, uh, Richard and also for staying within, uh, within time. Uh, I also want to say the presentations, uh, the reports from the three countries are available online and also the presentations that are um, being made in the webinar will be shared with all registered uh, participants. I see we also have many questions. Please keep uh, the questions on the, on, on the question and answer option on the platform. We'll have them answered at the end of the webinar. Uh, the next uh, presenter, we still have two more uh, uh, colleagues presenting. Please keep to the 15 minutes uh, because I see we slowly running out of time. Our next presenter is Brenda Chitindi, the Executive Director of the Tobacco Free Association of Zambia, Tofaza. Uh, Brenda, welcome. Um, thank you very much, John. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, like you, you have seen the, the presenters from other countries, the African countries, Africa has been invaded by tobacco industry. So I think ATCA has a lot of work to do and we, we need to work in together as African African countries to see to it that the tobacco industry activities are exposed as much as possible. Thank you. Yeah, tobacco, how tobacco, the, in our introduction, we conducted a big tobacco alice in Zambia with some stakeholders and the civil society as well, where we combined to get this data on the big tobacco alleys. Tobacco corporations, oh, tobacco corporations are, Caleb, what's happened? The tobacco corporations are sure to fail and are heavily criticized if they attempt to directly undertake an activity in the economy. So they have resorted to using other people or entities to present their cases. Next slide. And the, our findings were companies and entities engage in activities that create an opportunity for the industry to eventually either undermine the implementation of tobacco control policies or portray as good image of itself as a stakeholder or development partner. And such activities include, that is partnership with the government entities Uh, promotion of their products through using, using their allies and support to govern policies also through 
and community using using their allies and the, endo the endorsement and also the collaboration. They do a lot of collaboration and in endorsing a lot of unnecessary activities to make sure to see to them that to see to it that they are a, a support to the government and to the public. Yeah, on partnership. In February 2019, the Zambia Chamber of Commerce and Industry, this, the Zambia Chamber of Commerce and Industry is under the Ministry of Commerce, Trade and Industry. So they work, they interact in so many activities with the, the ministry. And the, 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 the Zambia Chamber of Commerce and Industry partnered with the British American Tobacco Zambia to organize a youth access prevention, a campaign which has an objective to raise awareness on, effect, on effects of underage smoking across Zambia. This is just a pretense pretending that uh, the they protect the, the underage while they are just uh, advertising to the underage so that they are initiated to tobacco use. The next stage. And on promotion. In September 2017, Zambia Development Agency, this agency also is under the Ministry of Commerce, Trade and Industry signed an investment promotion and protection agreement with British American Tobacco Zambia. The investment promotion and protective protection agreement covers the, invest, covers the investment of 15 million US United States dollars for the construction of a British American tobacco cigarette factory and a head office in Lusaka South Mount Facility Economic Zone. This, this South Lusaka, this Mount Facility Economic Zone, it also, it also, it also has the, Lowland Imperial Tobacco, a manufacturing company which produces 20 million cigarettes of 20 million cigarettes per day. And most of them is, is used locally at national and also is exported, is exported. And the, it is found that we found that the the, the domestic market is more than the, more than the, the, the export. So like youth, they use a lot of, uh, a lot of these tobacco products from these factories. And the next one, the endorsement. We have the Zambia National Farmers Union. This union is under Minister of Wood of agriculture, that is to lobby government to exempt that on tobacco. The Zambia National Farmers Union also prominently lobbies on behalf of the tobacco industry in Zambia. Amongst others, it, it undertook a strong campaign requesting the government to exempt on green, to exempt tax on green leaf tobacco. And in 2016, during a Tobacco Association of Zambia annual general meeting, that was the, that was, that was the, covered by the president of Zambia National Farmers Union, gave assurance of continued support on lobbying government for tax exemption 
in order to improve competitiveness and productivity aimed at stimulating investment. So you can see tobacco, tobacco companies, they don't pay enough tax. They are mostly exempted, they are almost exempted from paying tobacco taxes. So, which is a very, very serious for our country with the, with the current economy. And looking at the, the tobacco industry, these are mount millionaires, mount millionaires, where if they pay good taxes, then they, the government can benefit out of, these, out of these taxes. The next slide. The support, you can see how people, how organization or people are enticed in this, in this tobacco industry activities. The Zambian company known as Beyond Research was identified during the, the survey. We identified that uh, this company with a stated aim of enhancing access to justice. That's its it, it mandate. And in 2018, it organized a framework convention on tobacco control, moot court competition, which brought together university students in Zambia and beyond to debate on the role in the framework convention on tobacco control. This was an anti-framework convention on tobacco control student essay competition. And students were invited to submit essays discussing whether Zambia should respect its obligations under the framework convention on tobacco control or instead grow its economy by promoting tobacco growing and production. It was the moot competition it, and it was officially opened by Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Zambia. And you can see how, how the involving even the, the learning institutions and beyond research also ran an essay competition on the theme, the way forward with tobacco in Zambia in 2017. So this, uh, both these competitions were titled against the implementation of the framework convention on tobacco control by Zambia, trying to make sure that the implementation of the framework convention on tobacco control is delayed or it or it's not it's not implemented, just like the the tobacco control bill. See, Zambia started the process of tobacco control bill in 2009 to date it has not been it has not been passed and on collaboration the british american tobacco and the university of zambia signed a memorandum of understanding to provide work experience to students and in April 2016, the University of Zambia signed an MOU with British American Tobacco Zambia, aimed at providing work opportunities for students at University of Zambia after completion of their schools. Next slide. And on this big tobacco alleys, our recommendations are that the government must adopt the tobacco products, nicotine control bill, 
this bill was was reactivated in 2018 after it went dormant from 20 from 2009 so it was reactivated in 2018 and the second recommendation was stakeholders should increase advocacy and public awareness on tobacco industry interference in tobacco control policies. Uh, as the Tobacco Free Association of Zambia, we have organized a number of stakeholders to tackle this tobacco industry interference. We need to expose all the activities in, in order to, to to safeguard our public health policies. The third recommendation is the capacity of civil society organization should be enhanced to enable themselves champion and expose tobacco industry interference at all levels. The, the other recommendation was corporate social responsibility initiatives by tobacco companies should be rejected and that the government should be strictly on article 5.3 guidance they should follow that guidance for for public health policies to be achieved in zambia then the last recommendation is state and non-state entities should prioritize prioritize public health and cut collaboration ties with tobacco companies. Because right now it's, you know, we have, we have a lot of big, a lot of tobacco industry interference in the policy domain. So as civil society, we are saying, please, please let the government cut those collaboration ties with, the camp with tobacco companies. Uh, next slide. And our conclusion is there is sufficient evidence to show that the activities of tobacco industry, front groups and allies have been hampering Zambia's tobacco control efforts, including adoption of the Tobacco and Nicotine Product Control Bill of 2018 and the efforts continue to be made by tobacco control advocates to ensure Zambia complies with the guidelines of the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And the last one, no meaningful progress can or will be made if the front groups can continue their activities without any inhibitions. The next slide. Oh, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brenda. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. That's Brenda Chitindi from Tofaza. Our last presenter is Andy Rowo. Andy is a writer and a journalist who specializes in environmental and health issues. And, um, and Andy, he, he has written and researched and, uh, and uh, exposed the activities of the tobacco industry on and off for 20 years. And uh, for the last 10 years, he has worked at the Tobacco Control Research Group, that's uh, TCRG at the University of Bath, huh? where he is director. Uh, tobacco con uh, tobacco tactics. Thank you, Andy. Welcome. Thank you, John. Um, and uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you know where everyone is. Uh, bonjour, ça va. Um, hopefully, my presentation is going to be shared on the screen. Brilliant. So um, I'll keep. I'll try and keep it brief. I mean. Um, I was asked to give some sort of global case studies of, of the tobacco industry use of intermediaries. And um, I'm just gonna give you some, a few quick examples. So next slide, please. 
So often when we do this kind of research, it's really good to sort of look at what the industry's own documents in their own words, leaked documents, which show a kind of snapshot of uh, how they use front groups, you know, to, to get what they want. So I'm just going to give you a few quick examples just, you know, over the last decade. Um, and then a quick, I mean, we've heard about the, the foundation from, for Smoke Free World um, from Claudio and others. So I'll, I'll you know, we, I can't do a presentation without mentioning them. And also basically, you know, Claudio touched on it, but but increasingly what are some of the trends we're seeing about actually, we, we you know, it's no longer just a front group of the industry, it's fronts of fronts. Um, and, you know, a couple of resources that you can use um, at the end to fight back. So next slide, please. So um, in 2010, Philip Morris International uses third parties um, and it uses retailers against a point of sale ban. And um, many, many you know, countries face, uh, you know, might have a point of sale ban. And you can learn from the tactics um, that the industry used in the UK. And um, I quite often say that for, for a very powerful industry like the tobacco industry, it often uses the same tactics and arguments worldwide, and we can learn from that, even though it might just tweak little things. And, you know, Claudio highlighted retailers um, as a key ally for the industry. Um, and here, what, when it says NR, uh, NFRN, that's the National Federation of retail news agents. So that's the body of, of, of retailers in the UK. And the industry wanted to set up, quote, what it calls a grassroots campaign. And they were even going to, to train the, the, the retailer spokesperson in how to you know, talk to the media. Next slide, please. And it was called Project Clarity. And they were, they were trying to, to secure the active support of a hundred members of parliament who were gonna lobby on their behalf. And it, as it says, the campaign is designed to enable the retailers to talk directly to their MPs and for the commercial arguments to outweigh all other criteria. So basically what, again, another classic tobacco industry tactic is to try and argue that, you know, commercial arguments override health considerations. Next slide, please. So that's point of sale. Again, another classic, you know, uh, tobacco control fight is to, to introduce plain packaging. And here we go. This is more leaked documents from Philip Morris. This is 2012. And this is the overall objective is to ensure that plain packaging is not adopted in the UK. And the strategy is one of the key strategies is broad third party media engagement. Next slide, please. And one of the leaked slides gives a whole lot of media messengers. Um, now, many of them were on Claudio's list. So you've got, you know, retail, so you've got trade associations, you've got independent retailers, you've got business associations, you've got think tanks, um, you've got anti-illicit trade groups, you've got researchers and international groups um, as well. So those were the media messengers that they were going to use to, to, to fight their campaign. And what you suddenly saw, the, the person um, to the right of my screen is, is, is Mark Littlewood, who is the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. And he started appearing in the media to talk about against plain packaging. And this is a tobacco industry you know, funded think tank acting as a front for the industry to try and stop plain packaging happening. And uh, working with journalists like George Monbiot and others in the Guardian newspaper, you know, we exposed what was going on. Next slide, please. 
And again, this was, you know, here is the, the media messaging. Um, so again, often you'll see the industry use these arguments, illicit trades, trying to argue that if you introduce pain packaging, illicit trade will, will go up. The industry never says it's complicit in illicit trade or the legal implications or the impact on trade or there's no evidence. And again, classic industry tactics are to expand the costs of a regulation but downplay the hidden the, the health benefits. So, you know, again, they will use these arguments and these tactics in your country. And you can see on the, the, the media activity timeline, you know, was they really outlined how they were going to try and, you know, stop plain packaging, you know, to be implemented, which was what their um, campaign was trying to do. But luckily for tobacco control and public health, they failed. Next slide, please. Uh, the uh, Tobacco Products Directive in Europe, again, uh, leaked industry documents show that they were also, they were trying to use retailers, you know, to do campaigns. Again, they'll say a company event with social media, premier campaign led by third parties. So you won't see the tobacco industry, you know, doing the campaign, you'll see retailers front and center again, trying, you know, acting as, as the allies and the fronts for the industry. And the uh, tobacco uh, products directive was, was seen as the most lobbied dossier in EU history because the industry was able to mobilize, you know, retailers across Europe to try and undermine the legislation. Next slide, please. Some great leaked documents from Philip, uh, from Reuters, uh, from Philip Morris from 2014. And this slide, if, if no other slide you look at from a leaked document is the industry playbook in one slide, you know, and, um, and, it, and it's, it's outlining what it's trying to do on media relations, on political uh, engagement. And there it is, you know, and, you know, what we are aiming for, this slide says, an alliance of credible messengers, third party coalition building. So there it is again in, you know, coming from the horse's mouth, as we say, that Philip Morris is trying to use third parties to be, you know, its messengers. Next slide. And again, this is from the same PowerPoint. Um, playing the pol political game so how how does it you know get it get get what it wants in politics and then it goes find allies that cannot be ignored so industry classic tactic is to use allies wherever it can to use fronts like retailers or think tanks or other business groups and sometimes you know it just sets up its own massive front group next slide please You know, we've we, Claudio and others. We're talking about the foundation for for Smoke Free World. You know, launched in 2017, headed by Derek Yak. It claims that it is independent. It claims that its memorandum of understanding and its articles of association are um, it is independent, and it claims that it also wants to accelerate the end of smoking. But nearly all the money to the foundation is coming from Philip Morris. You know, this is a front group for Philip Morris. Next slide, please. And this this is taken from Tobacco Tactics. Um, and again, as Claudio um, mentioned, some of these, these uh, groups. So what you have now, instead of like Philip Morris directly funding one organization, you now have Philip Morris funding Foundation for Smoke Free World, who are now funding, say, Knowledge Action Change in the UK or the International Network of Nicotine Consumers. So it's getting harder for us as, you know, journalists or academics or researchers to, you know, to follow the money and to find out where, you know, how many are actual front groups and how many are, you know, being paid by the industry. Um, so it's getting harder and as the industry gets more and more devious and trying to find ways to get round article 5.3. Next slide, please. Um, 
and what this is a very recent article from from Australia. Um, what what's been uncovered is um, that you know Philip Morris was using a funding a PR company which was funding uh, the Australian retailers again. So notice we go full circle. This is retailers being funded, but this time it was actually trying to promote vaping. So again, you know, you've got tobacco industry funding sort of pro vaping messaging too, but again, it's being done by third parties and notice retailers. Next slide. Another tactic we're seeing increasingly is uh, Philip Morris trying to, to fund, uh, you know, media groups like Vice Media. So if you're contacted by, by a so-called journalist, it's now it's always worth checking whether they are, you know, a completely independent journalist or whether they're actually even being funded covertly by the tobacco industry. Next slide. Uh, some some resources we can use we've um as part of the uh, part of stop we've we've been trying to build an allies database um we've it's not comprehensive at all so far we've got 110 organizations you can check out the map on exposed tobacco um and again we they're broken down into astroturf front groups and third parties you know, get in contact with us if you think there's an organization that, sh you know, should be on that list, that it isn't on that list. And next slide, please. And again, you know, this seminar, you know, this is great. This, this, we should be doing more of this. We should be coming together um, and, you know, talking together about allies and front groups, the great reports that just come out from all these countries. And also, finally, I would say, you know, as a starting place, you know, always check tobacco tactics and see if an organization that pops up, you know, in the media, in your country, you know, check to see there as a, as a first point of call, whether we've logged it as a front group already. And if not, and you got, if you have heard of evidence, you know, please get in contact with us because we're always, you know, willing and ready to hear from you and help to expose the tobacco industry and its use of allies and front groups. So thank you so much to uh, ATCA and to John for chairing and for everyone being here and the other, pan other panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Andy. I think we are coming to the end of our webinar today. We only have about uh, five questions that have not been answered. And um, I want to take the shortest time possible uh, because we're already four minutes past our time. Um, I want to ask uh, maybe the presenters to just answer, please, each question, one minute. I have about four. Uh, the first question is from Isetas Corbin Metedio. I think this is probably directed to Claudio or to Baguma. Uh, what is the stand of WHO on the countries that doesn't follow their laws in enforcement of tobacco control? Case study in Uganda, the enforcement of this law remains in paper form in the upcountry because police is reluctant in this law. Uh, after that, I ask also Philip to answer this question from Togeda Jacobs. Hello, we are doing research on in tobacco taxation in Senegal, Ghana, and Nigeria. Have you found any tobacco industry lobbying the ECOWAS parliament? And then Brenda, about shisha, do you have any regulation prohibiting shisha in your respective countries? And I think, Andy, finally, you can uh, take this for us. How does tobacco taxation work in countries with very big industries? Yeah, thank you. I think we can, uh, Claudio, you can uh, take the first question, please. Yes, thank you, John. So about the WHO, uh, well, the WHO follows the FCT, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, and its guidelines. And Article 5.3 
uh, prohibit any inter uh, interference of the tobacco industry when it comes to public health policy, particularly tobacco control. The, the, the problem here is that the WHO through the FCTC doesn't have the ability to sanction countries for uh, the violations or of this Article 5.3. Uh, and, and we know about many violations. The, the thing that, that we can do, uh, and probably FCTC, is to expose uh, these, uh, these, these violations and, and from groups uh, and the connection with the tobacco industry. But that unfortunately, there is any concrete sanction or action that WHO can, can take uh, when it comes to violation of Article 5.3. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. Philip, uh, have you found any tobacco industry lobbying in uh, the Recoas Parliament? R Richard, I see you had um, unmuted. Did you want to add <laughs> before? Yeah, because there was a, there was a direct uh, comment uh, on the Ugandan situation. Uh, it is a mixed bag for us, one, um, we have had tens of prosecutions uh, and sentences that have been meted out as a result of violations relating to the tobacco control law. Uh, and it's been various cases, uh, the ones who are selling illegal products, the ones who are bringing them into the country, the ones who have been smoking in public in violation of the law, I think that's been the largest number of cases. We have had raids by police together with us, um, the civil society and other activists related to Shisha, including now during the COVID time. Um, so we have had uh, enforcement uh, activities going on. We have even been discussing, I sit on the National Tobacco Control Committee, it's the body designated in law, for tobacco control and it has civil society representation. We have been discussing and we are actually meeting on the 9th, no, no, on the 10th. We are meeting uh, representatives of all government ministries, departments and agencies to also sensitize them about the law. Uh, we have not reached where we would want to be. So yes, in especially some of the upcountry areas, uh, the, the enforcement agents I, I think have not understood that they must implement this as the other law. So yes, there are some areas where there are weaknesses and also we have had some very useful successes that we are building on. So an, an enforcement is a crime. In fact, this you know, last year we also finished the guidelines for enforcers uh, with support of WHO and the African Tobacco, no, the, the Center for Tobacco Control in Africa. Uh, so that is also what is forming the basis for our enforcement. And Kampala City, our city of Uganda, is part of the cities that are being supported by the Bloomberg Philanthropies uh, for the, the city free, the smoke free initiative. So, yes, there are things happening and there is much more to, to happen. Thank you, Richard. Uh, Philip, are you there? Okay. Uh, Brenda. I know Shisha is banned in Uganda, in Kenya. What about in uh, Zambia? Um, shisha in Zambia is not banned and it's not prohibited. Like I mentioned those factories, they are, pro they are, pro they are producing Shisha like anything and they have brought in gadgets where you find the Shisha you smoking in all shopping malls and the, almost everywhere, especially the youths, have uh, a smoking seizure everywhere, including the malls, the shopping malls, the, everywhere, I would say. There's no prohibition on that one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, Andy, how does tobacco taxation work in countries with very big industries? I mean, I think it's. I mean, I think it's interesting that the whole tobacco taxation thing. Um, we know that taxation, you know, increasing taxes on cigarettes is one of the best ways um, to reduce consumption. Um, but we also know that the industry will argue that it pays its fair share through through tax. 
um, what we, but what they don't, you know, do is pay for the long term health and cost of smoking. If one in two long term users die of tobacco and many others get sick, um, then, you know, those costs are not picked up by the industry. So there's a real sort of um, snowball now of, of the polluter must pay, the industry must pay for the, co the true cost of its um, of the sick and the death and the disease that it, it, you know, sickness it causes. So, I mean, the industry, you know, will say we, we do pay, but actually the cost is much greater to society. Um, and the co you know the cost to, to national health budgets and and the cost and the burden um, in that way. I, I think the other thing I would also say in many African countries, you know, the industry is very good at avoiding paying tax itself and you know transfer prices its profits out of the country into other jurisdictions. So you know there are many cases to answer there about the in industry activity and the way it behaves too. Thank you. Uh, definitely, I think we still have many unanswered questions, uh, but uh, because of time, if you still have a question that you wanted to ask, uh, which, or which has not been answered, uh, please let us know. Uh, you can send them to ATCA and then we can direct them to the right person uh, to answer uh, to you directly via email. Thank you so much for participating in the webinar, which uh, is still available on ATCAS Facebook page in a recorded version. Uh, the presentations will also be shared to with all registered uh, participants. Thank you very much and have a good day.